on this morning uh, of the, the, the whole value chain in Carfibra. So that means we will start with our carboxylic acid platform that will be presented by Thomas Williams. He, is a, he has a master degree in industrial engineering and he works as project engineer in, in Dranko. Uh, important is he is an expert in anaerobic digestion or dark fermentation, which is one of the, let's say, the, 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 the building blocks in theory of, of the short chain carboxylic acid platform. Uh, let's see how, how we are going. So Thomas, as soon as your presentation will, there it is. So in theory, it should come soon. No, it's there. Okay. All right, thanks. No. So Hello everyone, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about the carboxylic acid platform. So the, the new um, polarization technology ch that is uh, applied in uh, Cafepla. I will go a brief introduction because a lot of partners already introduced Cafepla project and uh, the, the importance of uh, the short chain carboxylic acids in the Cafepla project. Then I will talk about the carboxylic acid platform on itself, the technology behind it, and how we usually test organic waste feedstocks. Um, and then we, I'm going to talk a bit more about the implementation on a pilot scale. And then I will go into detail about the results and I'll make some my conclusions about it and some uh, future perspectives. So first of all, um, let's highlight a bit why the organic waste um, needs to be improved um, and innovated. So organic waste uh, now is being used, and in this case uh, as a feedstock, but um, within Dranko we already uh, established a uh, technology which, um, which is the anaerobic digestion and uh, in which we create uh, biogas uh, from so all sorts of organic waste um, but we want to uh, improve this technology because the um, dependence on non-renewable carbon um, resources is still very high and um, innovation uh, in this technology is a necessity because it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions more, it will creation of new sources of uh, renewable energy um, and it will uh, reduce also waste disposal costs and create jobs um, with the implementation of this new pretreatment. Um, I will go briefly over this Cafepla process flow because Esther and Thomas already highlighted it. Um, but the carboxylic acid platform here in Cafepla is an important one because it serves as the building block for a lot of different applications. Um, and um, that is why this is a key element in the Cafepla project. Um, so, how does it work, the short chain carboxylic acid platform and the production of short chain carboxylic acids? Um, here you can see the uh, brief and uh, uh, overview of how anaerobic digestion works in the creation of uh, biogas. So we start off with a complex matter that comes in. This is going to be our organic waste feedstock. And through hydrolysis, this um, complex matter is broken down into macromolecules such as sugars, amino acids, uh, and fatty, um, uh, long chain fatty acids. Um, and then these are further broken down using acidogenesis. Uh, and then we create the volatile fatty acids, um, as well as acidic acids and hydrogen and, and carbon dioxide. So in a normal biogas produ production, these uh, three molecules that are created are further broken down. And eventually we create biogas uh, through uh, methane and carbon dioxide. But in the short chain carboxylic acid production, we wa actually want to stop the process. So we don't want methanogenesis, we don't want the acetogenesis, and we actually just want the volatile fatty acids. And by um, optimizing parameters, um, we create and produce these volatile fatty acids and they remain inside the reactor. Um, and that is a, a crucial pretreatment process step um, that serves as uh, the basis for uh, 
the, the carboxylic acid platform. So in this uh, case, the, the short chain carboxylic acid target molecules um, that we focus on in the Cofibla are acidic acid, propionic acid, and butyric acid. Um, these are the free target molecules that we want to produce as much as we can from the organic waste, um, organic waste as a feedstock. Um, and the first thing we want to do is we want to um, try to identify the maximum uh, short chain carboxylic acid uh, potential. How much can we produce out of a certain amount of organic waste? And this is being done by a batch test. And uh, what it also serves um, is that we identify uh, process parameters. So uh, uh, testing different pHs, testing different temperatures. And then we also can see uh, what the spectrum is. So what type of uh, short chain carboxylic acid we can produce uh, using a set uh, pH and set temperature. Um, and this will serve as a basis for um, further uh, upscaling of the short chain carboxylic acid production. Um, and here's an example. Um, so as you, as you can see, um, we start off with a lot of lactic acid in the first few days of um, this batch test. And the lactic acid and ethanol is built up uh, with also some production of acidic acid, but that isn't much. But after day two, day three, and et cetera, you see that the butyric acid starts to form. Um, and then after seven, after seven days, you also see that caproic acid is also being formed. So, um, and you can also see that from day seven to day 11, the COD, uh, soluble COD is a little, is very consistent, but and also the spectrum of the short chain carboxylic acid stays consistent. So. That's an example of a batch test in which we can see that, okay, for this type of organic feedstock, we see that there, there is potential to create a lot of butyric acid with certain pH and certain temperature. Um, so that is being done you, uh, and to test all kinds of uh, waste streams um, in order to identify uh, what they could produce uh, given set parameters. But this is a batch test, so this isn't being tested on a continuous scale. Um, and that's why we need to, uh, after that, we need to um, test these uh, potential uh, great uh, organic feedstocks with a continuous lab test. And in these continuous lab tests, we identify the and test the optimal parameters that we uh, concluded in the batch test, and as well as test the retention times and the organic loading rate. Um, these two last two parameters are also very important uh, with a uh, perspective of upscaling and eventually designing and testing a pilot scale. So the test duration of, of this continuous lab test is a minimum of 30 weeks in which we try to uh, test uh, different retention times, different organic loading rates, um, as well as the pH and temperature. Um, and then we also see, okay, how much can we produce uh, with these cer certain parameters and um, gain a lot of information that will serve as a, uh, as, as a basis for the upscaling to a pilot. So after that is done, we eventually scale up. We identify the optimal parameters, which we are, are going to use in the pilot. Um, and we use the same input and output char characteristics as being identified in the continuous test case, and as well as the same downstream processing steps. So in this case, and for this uh, Kaffeepla, we, we started from the biowaste that we identified as a great organic uh, feedstock, and then we ferment it in the loop reactor, and then we press it and decant it, and eventually we get a, uh, a, a good, uh, and rich uh, carboxylic acid uh, stream. So now a bit more about the pilot. So the pilot, um, the, the feeding, the organic feedstock that we used was Idolux bio waste, um, which is very high in dry matter. Uh, and we wanted to 
uh, keep the dry matter as high as possible um, in order to gain a lot of uh, nutrients out of it, which we can then use to create a lot of uh, short-chain carboxylic acids. So, um, in this case, a, um, a conveyor belt and a feeding funnel was necessary um, in order to uh, consistently feed the, the loop reactor, uh, as you can see here at the first picture where we um, load up the material uh, and then on the, at, a, at a steady pace it goes into the, into the, the reactor on, on the left side, which you can see in the second picture. Um, it falls in and then it's, it's being uh, transported with uh, the first trans uh, conveyor screw, uh, which will push it to the two silos. And beneath those two silos is, an, is a second uh, conveyor screw that is perpendicular to the first one. And this, uh, this second conveyor screw actually pushes it up the first silo. And then it, it's, it, it, uh, it, it's being homogeneously mixed um, through, this, uh, through this creation of a loop. Um, and in that way, we mix the, mix the high dry matter content of the organic feedstock um, and um, as well as uh, ferment it and play with the uh, different parameters that we set. Okay, so after fermenting is done, we established a, uh, a good short chain carboxylic acid production. We need to extract um, some content of the of the loop. We don't extract all of it because then we start from nothing. We want to keep a certain set amount of it inside the reactor to maintain a, 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 the, the right biomass as well as the, um, yeah, so the, the biological process isn't disturbed. Um, so we extract the output um, in which we collect it in a bio box. And then um, it is being transported to the top. And here, uh, for this pressing step, we use the screw press technology. Also, because the dry matter percentage is quite high, and um, the only option that we had was either a screw uh, press technology or a hydraulic press technology. But the screw press technology was chosen over the hydraulic press technology because of the, um, of the high uh, the bit that he can reach, uh, or, or process uh, speed that he can reach, in, uh, which is very nice in this case, um, because it then we can process and press a lot of it in one day. And if we would use a hydraulic uh, type of technology, it would be in batch periods and would, would take very longer um, for it to, to process eventually. And then operators will be uh, busy for two to three days to press a lot of the kilograms. Um, so eventually we use we reach two fractions. We see, we reach the press cake, and we reach the press water. The press water is to be it's where all the rich short, short chain carboxylic acids are present, and which will be we uh, we will uh, further purify using a decanter. Um, the decanter um, was used and, and chosen because the solid content that was still present in the press water was uh, very high. And if we would um, say to the partners, okay, here is our press water, they wouldn't be very much happy with it because there's still a lot of uh, solids in it that could uh, cause potential fouling uh, and also be um, have like a... Um, uh, disturbances with the production of, um, uh, yeah, from microbial proteins, for example, uh, would uh, lower the yield. So decanting was uh, necessary, and as you can see, the fraction that we get out of it, um, uh, yeah, uh, further uh, strengthens the hypothesis um, because a lot of solids were still present after decanting it, and. Uh, um, that, so the, that step was also necessary, but uh, decanting um, that we did um, proved to be very useful and, and also was uh, a very uh, operator-friendly technology. Um, so uh, yeah, that was the, without any problems. So here, um, as I 
Okay, so uh, the short chain carboxylic acid production that we did from the pilot test case, I'm gonna go over it, um, that we produced. The average production of, um, from the pilot, uh, we reached 20 kilograms uh, on average per week. Um, but what you can see here is the uh, large amount of butyric acid uh, that is present. Uh, I, I gave a good uh, a snippet of the total. Um, but I'm very excited in the fact that there's a lot of um, butyric acids present, um, which is very, very good, uh, and that, that can be used to, to distribute to the partners, but it also exemplifies that um, the, the effectively upscaling towards a pilot test was uh, a success, as in we, we read similar conditions to the continuous lab experiments, uh, obviously, you can still see there's a lot of lactic acid present, which gives the idea that there's still room for more uh, production of short-chain carboxylic acids, because lactic acid is the first step in reaching these uh, target molecules. So uh, the fact that there's still a lot of lactic acid present means that we can theoretically produce even more short-chain carboxylic acids. Um, then what, what happens with the residual streams? So the press cake from the, from the pressing technology and the centrifugal solids from the, from the, yeah, from the decanter, what happens with that? So um, as we try to, to uh, make the, the, the circular um, in, in Idolux, um, we try to test for the potential of biogas. Um, which was also done using a batch test and a continuous test, but then in case of biogas. Um, and those tests uh, revealed that there's still a lot of potential uh, of biogas uh, that we can reach when we integrate it into the Dranco technology. So um, this was now proven, uh, which means that we can effectively use all these residual streams in the Dranco technology. So what that means is, we can produce the short-chain carboxylic acids on one side, but we can also use the residual streams to further uh, still get some biogas out of it. So nothing of residual streams is left over. Everything is being used in the process and the creation of, um, yeah, of, of, of uh, uh, valuable materials that can, be, that can be used for other applications. Um, so, um, I think uh, the, the Coffee Plat project uh, was successful in creating an innovative uh, pre-treatment, especially for the carboxylic acid platform, um, because we reached the short-chain carboxylic acids uh, that we wanted to, and we see that there's more potential of it, um, and that we can even create more short-chain carboxylic acids, um, and as well as that the, that the residual streams are yeah, that they still contain a lot of biogas potential, so they can also be used as biogas. Um, and this, this proves that the pretreatment of carboxylic acid platform um, that we want to integrate with the Dranco technology is, is, is a, a, a way to go for uh, in the next coming years. So, questions? No questions. Everything clear. Call it. Uh, no, later. <coughs> this is. See. Sí? See. Sí. Well, congratulations. Your very clear talk. This is Martin Soriano from Setema Hoop. So my question is, Thomas, um, how sensitive is this? process to the, pres to the presence of the non-organic material in the feedstock? This isn't a precise fermentation technology. So um, we, we don't have an idea of what types of strains of, of, of um, let's say, chain or elongating bacteria are present. Um, it's, it's too difficult to, to find out. But uh, using continuously experiments and, and, and uh, testing different uh, waste streams, we identify that using and, and, and focusing on just a, the, a set of parameters, we can uh, we can reach the short chain carboxylic acid. So 
Um, no, there's no precise fermentation needed. Um, and that will reduce also the, the cost of um, uh, operation. Uh, um, because we, we, we try to keep a certain set of, PA, uh, of, of parameters, test parameters, that, that we know uh, if we keep those parameters uh, as consistent, that we, that we reach, that we want the searching carbon dioxide capacity we want to reach. But not uh, not in the in the in the case that okay we want to reach a um, consistent amount of this parameter this parameter this parameter this parameter so um, it's a very flexible uh, type of fermentation um, it's it's the same with the Dranco technology that's also very flexible. Uh, more questions. Everything clear. <laughs> Thomas, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, okay, and then I will present now um, the second part, also of of uh, the platforms, also uh, also one part of the fiber recovery platform, where we are uh, also one option to treat the, the residual streams, as Thomas said already is. Uh, to go for biogas production or composting. We were doing also composting tests. Uh, but the other option is um, to, ex to, ext to extract fibers. Out of it. And uh, so we, we are using there a uh, so-called, um, for us it's called wet extraction, but it's in reality it's not wet. So it's, uh, it's more to distinguish it between the drive uh, route, which will come uh, explain t volt afterwards. Okay, um, so natural deep solvents solvents um, for the recovery of fibers of municipal bio waste. As also Steph was mentioning it, is that in a normal biogas process, uh, the carbon taken up or the CO2 taken up by the plants ending up in the bio waste. By burning the methane, you're releasing the CO2 again. It's, it's circular and you are relying only on, on the, the CO2 which was taken up short term from, from the environment. But there exists also an option to remove the CO2 at least for a certain time frame from the, from the uh, environment. That means if you are not releasing the CO2 again, we are saving it, for example, in form of fibers and uh, implementing it in materials uh, which have a longer lifetime, as, as also Thibaut later there will explain it. So that means we are removing actively CO2 from the environment if we are using these fibers from, from, from the bio waste. Um, as Thomas was explaining already, so we are coming from our biomass loop where we are transforming the easy degradable uh, fraction into uh, short-chain carboxylic acids or vo volatile fatty acids. And then we are using a screw press. Um, maybe somebody had the question, but uh, was not asking it, why the screw press is so high, because it was uh, idea from either Lux to, also from Maria Lin to, uh, not to use so many pumps, reducing energy consumption. So that means the press water coming out of the screw press can be collected directly under it and you don't have to pump it uh, in, the, in the storage container. So th for that reason, uh, the system is so high. So that we have then on one side the short-chain carboxylic acid-rich uh, effluent or the fiber-rich solid residues, which can be used in biogas testing or composting, but also uh, to as it is the lignocellulosic part, mainly from, from our uh, municipal biovis, which could be recovered or uh, we tested it. So the question was uh, also, should we use some technologies as a new technologies, which are <coughs> certainly better to our environment because <coughs> we could use uh, other types of solvents or acids or whatever. Uh, so that uh, the question was if, so-called natural depoitectic solvents could help us to purify these lignocellulosic material, these fiber material, and to obtain a product which can be, be used in, in, in different applications. Then maybe first a sh short, what is a depoitectic solvent? Very short only. Uh, and then uh, we are going what we did in the project. So that means uh, you can get a melting point depression 
uh, under eutectic conditions of an eutectic mixture, if you're mixing a hydrogen bond acceptor with a hydrogen bond donor, uh, creating this deep eutectic solvent. Okay, so that means um, the compounds itself, for example, are not liquid. And maybe they have a melting point. I have here, for example, an example. Choline chloride has a melting point of 300 uh, degrees centigrade. So that means it's most likely not possible to use it under normal uh, conditions as a solvent. Urea 133, okay, that could be maybe reached. But I mean, uh, th these are conditions where you would also need a lot of energy to heat it up, that it is solvent, uh, as a liquid, and that you can use it. So that means choline chloride together with urea has a melting point of 12 degrees, for example. So that means under room conditions, as a room temperature conditions or more normal conditions, uh, it is liquid. And uh, depending on the application, it could be used as an as a solvent. That has, of course, depending on what you want to extract, you have to test that. So, and this is where then later on the natural deep eutectic solvents come from, is that you are using really natural compounds, uh, choline, for example, uh, or lactic acid or, or other compounds, um, and try to combine them in the proper way to get um, yeah, a natural deep eutectic solvent co uh, called NARDIS. And this is what we did. So that means we, we, we tested in the laboratory a lot of different um, yeah, NARDIS in terms of, as I said already, melting point is uh, interesting because from this, uh, your, your, your working conditions will depend. Viscosity is also quite important because if you want later on to recover your fibers and you have a very viscose medium, and it's most likely more difficult. And then, of course, the toxicity, because only because the substance is natural means not that maybe it, uh, it cannot harm at a certain way the environment uh, was taken into account during our test trials. Using all the time, uh, starting with the, 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 the yeah, solid residue from the test trials of our carboxylic acid platform. So it means you, you test the solvent, the different combinations, um, you get the solubilization, and then you, later on you can recover the fibers uh, from, from this material. Um, so, but the question is, is it working or you're recovering something or what is uh, there going on? So here you have only a short uh, example. As on the left side, you have the bio waste, how it is. And in reality, they're both, um, the blue and the red one down, also one the blue is the cellulose and the other one is the lignin, so lignocellulosic fibers. So uh, this is the, the interesting part uh, to recover. As you can see in the lab scale test, also then we have the press kick. The press kick itself leads already there uh, to a reduction of certain compounds as we are degrading the easily degradable organics and recover them as short-chain carboxylic acids. However, later on, the application of our NARDIS uh, leads to a further purification of, of these fibers to, to more than 50% of, of, of the original um, also, um, material. So that, that in the end, it's fiber-rich material, especially if you are comparing it also to other uh, fibers on the market. Okay, so then the next question was, uh, yeah, can we, it's one thing to do it in a small scale. Can we, we, we upscale it? Um, here on the left side, you see the, the solid uh, uh, bio waste inside the reactor. And then there you see it's completely also it's solubilized, yeah? the material when it comes in, in, in contact with our, our NADAS. So what we did then is starting from a three liter scale, uh, testing our parameters, optimizing the parameters. Um, then we were going to the 15 liter scale, then we are also um, adopting a little bit uh, the, the processing scheme, uh, one step to two, a two step treatment with a pre cleaning and, 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 and uh, later on an extraction step and recovered um, the fibers. And then the question was at a uh, uh, yeah, bigger scale, are we able to recover similar amounts or get via similar purification uh, of lignocellulosic uh, components, then in the lab scale uh, results, they are slightly lower, but we get 
similar purifications as in the lab scale of, the, of this fibers which we are getting from the loop. In this, in, in this case, they are not from the, the lab uh, experiments, they are really um, uh, the, the loop press cake, which was nicely sent all the time from Ida Lux, from Maria Lin, to us for, for the test trials there. So here we can conclude, so the purification or recovery of these fibers is possible, but now the question is, can we use these fibers? So depending, um, there comes also the downstream processing afterwards, as you recover these fibers, then you have uh, normally to dry them. So that means you can dry them by oven drying, then, but then you will have uh, bigger uh, agglomerates, which you, are, you need a, a, a milling step, for example, to get it in the correct fractions. Or uh, we are also testing, and that was very nice and very successful, fluidized bed drying, where you get already directly out a very nice powder, uh, uh, which can be then sieved in the different fractions and can be used for, for the different applications. So that means we, we tested them here uh, in Technalia. We, we, we made some composites out of it, some films of, of it, first with commercial PHP, but later on also uh, with the nice uh, PHPV sent uh, by Biotrend to us. So it was able to, to get uh, composites out of this uh, fibers, also com com um, combined with this bi biopolymers produced in the project. Uh, and we sent also then later on, uh, T-World will speak about this more in detail, uh, for more other industrial applications. One key question um, is in this context, um, because we are speaking about waste, the waste framework uh, directive in theory, if you have a waste, uh, you cannot incorporate it uh, back to the, to the economy. However, uh, the directive gives also is called end of waste criteria. So uh, if, you are, if you are complying with certain uh, parameters, you could also apply for a permit that this process or the incoming material is not any more waste and the final product could be used. So that means, first of all, um, the substance has to be used for, for certain things. That fibers we know, it's used in composites and other applications, so in theory it's used. Uh, the second step is that there should be a demand, as it should be not a niche market, there should be um, what's a demand for these kind of materials. As Esther was already explaining this morning, uh, yes, there exists also a market demand for, for fiber material, so there, there, this is also complied with. And then we should fulfill also the technical requirements, so that depends on the application, you have to test them if, if, if it can be used, and then you have to comply with standards applicable for the sector. There is sometimes certain problems that the current standards are more made for petrochemical substances, more standardized substances. So it's not one by one that you can take these standards and apply them to, to our material. But from the technical perspective, we tested them in different applications and, they're, also, and they could be, you, as you have seen also there in the, in the expositions, as there's some materials um, which can be seen. And the, the last one, this is the most important one, that you should not have um, negative environmental or health aspects from this uh, material because it's waste, it can come from waste. So uh, there we, we took, as a, only as an example, uh, the directive on packaging material. Why? Because packaging normally is in contact with, uh, with the humans, as, as we are touching it. So, and um, as in, in, in this waste fractions, depending, as we have heard also this morning already, uh, there can be a lot of other things inside which should not be there. Uh, we identified that heavy metals could be maybe a problem. So, and the, the directive said that you should have lead cadmium, mercury, and chrome. You should have less than 100 milligram per kilogram dry metal. And uh, as you can see, already in the lab tests, our tests confirmed that we are under this limit value. And as during the pilot implementation, we modified and improved a little bit also the technology. As you can see there in the pilot, the average is around 30 milligrams per kilogram dry matter. So that means we would also comply there with our fibers with this end of waste uh, uh, status. So now it's a question of either looks if they want to implement it then and ask for, for an end of waste certificate. 
Uh, however, also this shows that in theory these bioways can be, could be, also can be uh, converted uh, in a product which complies with the legislation. Okay, so if you have any question or as you can ask now, you can also ask my colleague Carlotta, I don't know Carlotta where you are there, um, she's more the expert of the, the laboratory implementation or you could also write me an email or, or call me. So I'm, if there are questions I can also answer them now. If not, then I would directly give the word to, to Tibold. He will go more in detail about our, our dry uh, uh, fiber extraction and then also more for the industrial applications because he did a lot of test rides there. Also Tibold is from Fiber Recovery uh, FRD from France. Uh, you're in, you have a PhD in material sciences and uh, yeah, he is quite an expert in treating uh, or recovering fibers. Uh, okay. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, first, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I would like to thank uh, all the people I have worked with during this project. It was a very deep and interesting project. Um, okay, this one. So, as you, they already explained, uh, at FRD, we focused a lot on uh, the valorization in a long-term application of the fibers, the insoluble fibers, so the solid part um, <clears throat> for diverse material applications. So it was uh, really to obtain uh, eco-circular long-term applications. Um, those fibers at the beginning of the project were investigated because there was a lot of feedstock available uh, at Idalux uh, in the Celtic Center. Um, and then we study a lot the transformation possible for those fibers. So as Thomas explained, they uh, study the wet transformation with the solvent uh, extraction. And at FRD, we study a lot the dry part uh, with uh, mechanical transformations uh, on those fibers. And at the end, um, I will show you the potential uh, of those fibers in different industrial applications. So firstly, uh, there was a lot of um, accessible feedstocks uh, in Edilux. Uh, the first one oh, was uh, the green waste, um, because they mix this green waste with the organic waste uh, to obtain the compost after the anaerobic digestion. Uh, this green waste is really pure because it was already selected by the municipalities, by the consumers, and put in a separated um, trash, uh, trash bin, trash can. Uh, at Idelux, they shred it, they do some mechanical operation to use it easily uh, in the anaerobic digestion. Uh, and there is some compost refugial. There was the paper waste, so the paper sludge, uh, which comes from different industrial applications. The scraps they recover after a first extraction of cardboards or papers for paper valorization. There is a lot of scraps, heavily polluted. And there was finally the organic waste, the famous one. Uh, so the kitchen waste already a little bit separated, purified uh, with some plastic pollution, for example, the digest state after the anaerobic digestion and the compost. So we try to uh, investigate all those different feedstocks rich uh, in fibers. Uh, for that, we um, transform them uh, with a dry uh, mechanism. So the first one was the shredding, the, the largest fibers, so the green waste, for example. They were shred to a smaller size to be easily grinded after that. Uh, they were all grinded to smaller size because in industrial application, they use long and small fibers, not large piece of food, for example. Um, this operation allows us to um, select different type of feedstocks. For example, the small part of the pre-shredded green waste uh, were too small for the grinding operation, very dusty. Uh, the same for the digestate or the compost or the paper or sludge. The mechanical transformation didn't add any value of them because there were already some powders. Uh, so we didn't select them um, for this dry uh, fiber recovery uh, method because we didn't uh, change anything on them. So we focus on those type of fibers, so the green waste, the kitchen waste, the paper scraps. 
uh, where we can add a lot of value with this mechanical transformation. And after that, we characterize them uh, with a lot of different ways. Uh, in a few minutes, I can't explain everything we obtain, uh, every results we obtain during these three years uh, on the project. But as you can see, we, we did a lot of characterization with different mechanical transformation. Um, for example, uh, I will just show you a few major results we obtain. Uh, the green waste uh, was very different. Uh, if we take the raw green waste, uh, it looks just receive or the ones they already transformed for the anaerobic digestion, or the compost refusal they obtain after some, um, some composting uh, operation. And after the mechanical transformation, as you can see, for example, there is a lot of fine powders, very fine powders, uh, dust pretty much, which is not very interesting for some industrial application, but could be valorizing in others. So we, thanks to this type of uh, results, we could orient, uh, decide what type of application uh, um, uh, is going uh, to be far, uh, what type of waste is going to what type of application, for example. Um, we, as uh, Thomas already presented, um, the chemical composition allows us to characterize the chemical composition, so the, the quantity of cellulose, of lignin, or of inorganic materials, uh, like the ash content, which could uh, be um, very uh, dangerous for some application because it uh, wear a lot the devices. Uh, realize that uh, the finest particles uh, are less rich in uh, structural components, so cellulose or lignin, for example, and some application we are focusing a lot on this uh, structural component. So we, we could like, uh, focus on the largest particles, for example, uh, we study the seasonality. If you, obviously, when you recover green waste, for example, uh, in the summer or in the winter, you don't have the same gardening application, the same uh, trimming by municipalities, so the waste is fluctuating. And it was very important to um, characterize this fluctuation for different applications, because currently, uh, the, industrial, um, the industrialist, they are used a natural product or very uh, uh, very well characterized product with homogeneity, a good homogeneity and no, no variation during the year, for example. Uh, we did the same with organic waste, as example in uh, the chemical composition, which is varying a lot because between the organic uh, waste uh, before and after the loop reactor and the NADES operation. Uh, the paper, too, uh, with a paper sludge containing, obviously, a lot of solubles at the left part. So the paper sludge was not interesting for applications which are looking for cellulosis. Um, after this broad characterization of the fibers, uh, we fix the transformation we can adapt for the potential uh, application after that. Uh, so in the dry part, uh, the first step is to dry the fibers. And it's very important because those fibers came from organic waste, they are stocked outside, so if you don't dry them, uh, you have some mold or some fungus which has to grow. Uh, and obviously in a lot of applications, uh, industrial are very um, afraid of health-related issues. So the drying is very important and it's very good. If you dry them at 60 degrees during two days, you have like no other uh, mold growing uh, after months. Is, uh, it's a good pasteurization. Uh, after that, those wastes are like municipal waste and cons post consumer waste. So uh, they are heavily polluted. They are not like the industrial waste, very uh, homogeneous, very well characterized. Um, and you can't start to mill uh, or to grind uh, fibers when, where there are a lot of stones inside, for example. So we, we depolluted. Uh, a lot of those fibers from stones, from metallic pollution. Because if we don't, as you can see, you will destroy the devices or you will start even ignition of the fibers if you start to grind some metallic pollutants. So the depollution was a very crucial part. Uh, where the fibers are clean enough, uh, you quickly, we quickly transform them, so the shredding part uh, first, to obtain a more homogeneous uh, materials which can be grinded. So after that, the grinding 
it's depending on the application. Some applications are looking for longer fibers, like two millimeters, some for uh, very short, very fine uh, powders, so we can grind even lower at a uh, few hundred mi microns. And the sieving uh, part in this pilot uh, is very important too, because some industrial are looking for um, fibers without dust, because the dust is rich is harsh content, as we characterize it, and the harsh can um, uh, destroy a little bit their device. Or they are looking for uh, um, fibers without, like, very rare but long fibers. We can put holes in their materials. So we characterize a lot of um, transformation possibles, and uh, we produce a lot uh, for that. For the organic waste, for example, uh, we, we already saw uh, in uh, the previous presentation this type of transformation, but uh, the price cake was dried too, and the dried price cake, cake is very rich in pollutant too, and this pollutant is uh, intricated inside the press cake from organic waste. Um, and for the paper scraps, uh, they are really heavily polluted, but with big pollutants. So it's easier to remove them because the paper is very light, like with an aspiration, for example. And after that, after that you grind them and you have those very rich cellulose uh, materials, fibers, but polluted with a lot of staples, obviously, because a lot of people don't remove the staples when they uh, throw the paper out. <laughs> so the dry, root is, the dry root is adapted for some of those uh, fibers, for example, the green waste I presented before, and the paper scraps. For the organic waste, as Thomas just explained, um, you have those um, health-related issues uh, where this uh, food waste have macerated a lot. Um, they are not clean uh, from an environmental and health point of view. So the NADES is a very good extraction for the organic waste because it sanitizes everything and it removes the plastic pollution integrated in the dry matter. And for the other ones, the dry transformation uh, was uh, preferred. And now I will present you the different potential applications at an initial point of view we, we um, succeed to, uh, to reach uh, during this project. Um, quickly, uh, because we were uh, working uh, at tier three to five, um, we are, we are, sorry, we were not looking to make an industrial application, but to find the best one, the one with the most potential, as um, Esther presented uh, from the Dekema presentation before that. So we, we contacted a lot of different markets, uh, which are already using fibers. Uh, we found the, the best one, we contact them. During this first exchange, they, uh, we obtained the specification for each different markets. Uh, that's why the purification is very important. Some of them don't want any stones. Some of them are very focused on the health-related issue, the size of the fibers. So this specification were crucial to know how to uh, transform the fibers after that. And we work with them by sending some samples, and they made some, uh, some tests, they made some materials uh, to see if those fibers could be adapted in their current process, because they use with homogeneous, clean fibers, like from uh, very specific production, um, hemp culture, for example, uh, and this is very heterogeneous, um, so it could be harder to adapt to their process. And in the same time, we made our own tests uh, in the consortium with Technalia, with other companies. We made some uh, of our own products to see if we could, uh, if the fibers could be uh, incorporated easily. Uh, so the markets with the most promising uh, application are the plastics market, the composites, the thermal insulation, and the construction, for example. Um, so the results on the right, uh, Thomas already showed you uh, those plastics just before. Um, some were made with um, what will be presented just after that, so the, the plastics made from the Kefipla loop. Uh, and we incorporated some fibers inside, and those plastics was, were tested in terms of biodegradability, for example, and mechanical resistance. In the same time, we send a lot of uh, fibers to different plastic industrials, uh, which are looking for like short fibers, long fibers, uh, green waste for uh, an aesthetical point of view, like in the bottom. Uh, because they are oriented in a design way to um, 
uh, to incorporate uh, waste inside that product, uh, to increase the mechanical properties, like the first one, for example, uh, and uh, they, they test like, the thermal stability, the organic uh, volatile compound inside, and they were very happy, uh, at least for the industrial who accepted to test them, uh, with the good compatibility of this waste, of this heterogeneous and slightly polluted waste inside their current process. They were uh, very interested to continue uh, at higher scale after that. Uh, in thermal insulation, we made at the pilot line a lot of uh, thermal panels. Uh, you can see them uh, in the coffee break after that. We bring some of them with green waste, with paper waste, for example. And um, those thermal panels, they were not optimized, uh, but they already show uh, uh, thermal conductivity with excellent properties, uh, as you can see in the uh, left figure, uh, between the two red uh, lines. This is the thermal stability, uh, the thermal conductivity of our product after a few pilots tests, and it's in the same scale than currently um, uh, saleable products, products you can uh, buy, uh, which are made with recycled fibers or bio-based uh, fibers. So there is a lot of opportunities for those heterogeneous waste, who, uh, which uh, have uh, like uh, good average uh, properties. Uh, the third good application is the building application. Uh, fibers are currently used in some mortars, cements, for example, or uh, adhesive for tiles. And uh, they use like clean wood fibers, clean hemp fibers, and they start to uh, like open up to new fibers to reduce their uh, carbon impact, um, or uh, uh, just to have a better uh, aspect, uh, visual aspect. Sometimes they want like visible fibers to reduce the sound quantity, for example. And we test them uh, in the consortium uh, at lab scale or pilot scale with some mortars, for example, in this side. Uh, and we obtained very good uh, mechanical results with some uh, fibers. For example, the loop um, organic waste after the loop operation and after the NADES cleaning uh, shows a very high mechanical properties for the mortars. Uh, and a class for mortars is, a better, uh, is the best current uh, class for mortars in industrial applications. Uh, some industrial actors test them in their own lab. Uh, and they found very good adhesion, even better than uh, the current value of adhesion value for adhesive tile, for example, thanks to some fibers uh, inside. And uh, like very good stability, they are testing the degradability right now. Uh, and they want to go further uh, at higher tier L2. And there is still like other markets open uh, with those fibers, like uh, in the furniture, for example. Uh, they are eager to substitute small part of the wood they already have from recycling. They recycle a lot of wood, but pure wood, or uh, already uh, wood from furniture, for example. And they found, like, with 10%, they are interested to, like, put 10% of green waste inside, because the green waste is heterogeneous. There is, like, hemicellulosis, which they don't have a lot in the already recycling wood. Uh, so that could increase the properties. So we test them at some uh, at lab scale too, and uh, in our, with different uh, samples. Um, some companies could extract directly the cellulose from the waste. Uh, I show you here the green waste extraction, but there is also companies who work with like organic waste to chemically extract the cellulose and have a very pure cellulose after that for textile application or chemical application, for example. And uh, with the um, results of the loop, uh, the cellulose content is very high, like 40%. So they are interested with those type of uh, things. And just in conclusion, um, we, we succeed to like, find very good markets, potential markets for those fibers. Um, we succeed to uh, reach some transformation, easy transformation. Uh, but the most crucial point is the depollution. Because it's like, uh, as Marilyn said this morning, um, those wastes are uh, from consumers. Uh, they don't sort very well. Uh, and it's very polluted with various type of pollution. And the depollution is very important because the waste has already heterogeneous. 
but you can't incorporate something polluted uh, in an industrial process which is sensitive to stones, to metals, to plastic for so in some case. So the, the depollution was investigated during this project at more industrial scale. Uh, the NADAS treatment is excellent uh, to depollute the organic waste, that was it was selected for the specific press cake, for example, because it's already sanitized and clean the, the plastics. And uh, as uh, Esther uh, explained this morning and Thomas just before that, the legislation on the end of waste statute was very uh, important to investigate and we spent a lot of time to to reach conclusion with industrialists, is it possible to use this waste in industrial application or uh, will they have some troubles with like legislation or regulation? And it's possible. Uh, with good cleaning, uh, we can reach uh, the, the legislation uh, rec um, needs. And that's all. Thank you very much. No questions? Well. Oh. Was it sorry, Victoria? Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas, for the introduction. So, first of all, I have to admit that it is not an exclusive Café Pla presentation because I thought it's maybe interesting for you also to get a few general aspects of those processes. And, of course, you will identify very clearly because of the... I mean, the type of the slides, the template, which is close to Café Pla and which not. So, as we all know, and as we already heard today from different speakers, bio-waste is not bio-waste. So, we are talking about a wide range of different type of materials. And um, this is already for sure a reason that we, we need to, um, yeah, go ahead with different technologies in order to make the first steps of the pretreatment. I will come back to that in a minute. We have already heard it also from Steph uh, in that pilot um, presentation and the different technologies we have to, to do. So I will come back to that. The lactic acid fermentation is part of the coffee pla and Kevin will give you further details about the use of our lactic acid for doing the caproic acid afterwards, but in my presentation, I more focus on the general use and the general uh, manufacture of lactic acid also for different purpose and application, okay? So just for those of you who are not familiar with Potsdam, so we are closely connected to the capital of Germany, Berlin, and uh, we have a very long uh, history in, in agricultural engineering and uh, also in bioeconomy. So just to give you an idea how to um, combine our own uh, activities at the Institute with ideas what we are discussing here, not only in this project but also in others. So, um, of course, the traditional agricultural engineering topics like livestock, crop production and food, that's not the main topic here, but we are talking about the biomaterials, what you can see left uh, bottom, and the integrated residue management, what we call it. And those both areas together are bridged by my group since we are using the different remaining materials, residues, side streams, waste, uh, leftover, whatever, and trying to uh, put them into uh, biomaterials via, for instance, lactic acid. So maybe you know those are similar um, 
uh, summaries about that, what we are doing if we want to shift from the fossil resources to the biogenic ones, then um, very often we call it biorefineries. And if we talk or if I talk about biotechnology and fermentation, of course, we just touch a part of those biorefinery uh, systems like the fermentation by enzymes or microbes, what you can see here. And um, it's um, already for a long, long time highlighted from those um, yeah, value chains or value circles that we, we should focus on the uh, remaining residues and waste materials as you uh, see focused here on, on the slide. Um, lactic acid, for those of you who are not so familiar with, um, has been identified as one of the most promising molecules already a uh, long time ago. And of course, you can find further studies like that one I put here on the slide on the right-hand side from um, the IEA bioenergy together with other molecules. So uh, this is what the interest of industry has in order to get access to so-called bio-based chemicals to make uh, products out of it. So just briefly again, that what we have in mind in order to um, convert all the waste, what we could have on the left-hand side, the different types of waste. We, of course, we don't like to give them to the, just to the landfill. And we don't like to just make, uh, as you can see from the, yeah, the symbol of burning on the uh, bottom, we don't like to just burn or make energy out of it, as, as we already heard sometimes today, in order to lose the CO2 immediately. We want to go quickly from the left to the right via the different uh, yeah, uh, processes and, and technologies, what you can see here, illustrated by a fermenter. So to transform the, uh, the bio-waste into the lactic acid, and as you can see from the right, then you have very different options in order to further subsequent processing of the lactic acid. But to be honest, the main interest at the moment by the industry and more and more also by the society and customers like uh, you and me in order to make bioplastics out of it for the different reasons, uh, applications in the packaging sector, uh, whatever. Um, as most of the so-called biorenewable chemicals also for the lactic acid fermentation, we need sugars because Probably you know, microbes love sugar. And among the sugars, the simple sugars like glucose are the, the favorite ones where we have to come to first if we go from, as in the example on the right hand side, very general lignocellulosic material, but in a very uh, often or in, in very many cases of the bio waste we have to deal with lignocellulosic structures and therefore that example uh, is more or less the same what we have to do. We have to make this pretreatment hydrolysis um, first steps of breaking down the structure of the lignocellulosic in order to release the simple sugars and then to make the fermentation and uh, depending on the structure and the type and the composition of the material we have to deal with hexoses, the C6 or the also with pentoses, uh, C5 sugars, that makes sometimes a difference, but in the end, it comes to the fermentation and then to the downstream processing separation to end up with a final product. And this is what I already uh, discussed briefly, is just highlighted here once again, together with a nice picture of our pilot plant facility. And uh, I was already thinking, probably I have to go to that um, platform and to register our pilot plant as well, since we are at least working in TRL 5. So it, it should fit to that what Steph was announcing before. So anyway, if we have a look to that 
for general steps of making chemicals out of any biogenic resources. Uh, I just highlighted the first. The pretreatment is one of the most critical ones, but we don't need to forget also the downstream, the purification, so we should not end up just with a nice um, fermentation and a dirty liquid full of our product, if it is full of it, but then we have to purify, we have to clean it up, we have to yeah, concentrate it in the very end to give it to the next step of further processing. And this is uh, sometimes a bit underestimated in my opinion and we, we need to work on it as well. So just to give you an idea what type of uh, material we already had in our hands and we are trying to expand our yeah, experiences with so many different materials from all over the world. Of course, uh, as you can see, there are still some white or in this case gray spots uh, where we are not already active like in Australia or also Africa is still untouched but uh, you know activities are going on and uh, yeah we try to find new resources so from this I just tried to share with you uh, a few samples of different projects with different materials this one was um, uh, a nice one together with Columbia for coffee residues what I was not aware before that coffee residues are so full with sugar since coffee for me like in the break before since a bitter stuff but if we go a bit more to the details so we will find a lot of very sweet material close to the coffee production and without going into the detail of that project and the results so in case you are interested you can read in our publications but just to give you an idea what we can use for making lactic acid Another one was from a previous uh, also BBI project, Perkal, which was dealing with municipal solid waste. We were already talking about that type of bio waste before. And this is just an example of, um, again, the upscaling of those processes into, a, in this case, we call it bench scale. The fermentation unit you can see here is uh, 70 liter. And we needed to do the same as mentioned before, the sugars and the nutrients needs to be provided to the microbes and then if the process parameters are more or less optimized, we can um, come up with a really nice yield of more than 90%. So that means 90, more than 90% of the carbon coming from the feedstock will be transformed into the product. Um, the final titer of the lactic acid with more than 60 gram per liter is also quite nice and um, what I already mentioned before, the purity and in this case the optical purity which is just uh, by the way very important for the bioplastic production so um, this was also successful fulfilled and um, yeah. And now I uh, come to the example of the bio waste from the coffee plow project. As you can see here from the left hand side, we again touched the organic fraction of municipal solid waste among others. And uh, with that just very simplified scheme of making the different steps of the process, I will give you an example where we selected the pasta waste for making the next steps of scaling up and downstream processing of the product. And the problem behind the pasta waste is just illustrated here briefly that together with the production of each kilo of pasta, uh, the industry is producing roughly 23 gram of pasta waste for different reasons. And we thought, okay, why not going a bit deeper into that particular type of waste. And um, for us as a biotechnologist or bioengineers, it was a, 
among other reasons, uh, that fact that we are in this particular case dealing mainly with starch, not with that very tricky stuff as mentioned before, the lignocellulosic. So the starch, uh, probably you know, the starch can be degraded uh, much more easy than lignocellulosic into the simple sugars. And we just tried to uh, go here with different uh, dosages of the enzyme in order to uh, destroy the structure of the starch into the sugars. And after having the sugars available for our microbes, we uh, tried to uh, proceed with two different um, operation regimes. The uh, first one, the SHF, is a separate hydrolysis and fermentation, so that means you separate the hydrolysis from the fermentation due to the different process parameters different uh, optima, and the second one, the SSF, the simultaneous saccharification and fermentation, means that you have everything in one pot um, with dealing a sort of compromise of the different parameters for the enzymes and the microbes. As you can see here, in the first approach, it was not that successful from the very beginning, so that means in case we would go ahead with such material, we, we would need to do a bit more on the, on the right part of the SSF, but for the other one, it was already working quite good. And then, uh, talking about enzymes, we thought it might be a good idea to make our own enzymes instead of um, buying them from the, yeah, the global players, uh, as you may, might all know. And we tried to do some approaches of the solid state fermentation, uh, what you can see on the left hand side. Really simple, just um, uh, wheat bran uh, inoculated by different uh, fungi. And as you can see from the diagrams on the right hand side, the different fungi behave a bit different in order to. Uh, have different results of the sugar release, but anyway, both of them were working quite well, and we are very happy to get this published recently as well. And in summary, we um, found out that we could produce roughly six gram of lactic acid out of that 23 gram of the pasta waste, uh, which is in case you are familiar with those figures, uh, more or less the average for the main type of products out of any biogenic resources that you need, three up to four parts of your feedstock in order to make one part of the product. So that's the case here as well. But as you can see here also from the left bottom, we end up with just a bit more than 50% after the downstream processing since the losses of all the different steps, what well, I cannot go into the details right now, but in case you are interested in that, of course, we can go ahead with that uh, discussion. And uh, just like to close my talk with some aspects, uh, very general in that triangle, what I like to describe all the time our activities dealing with the feedstocks, with the processes and the products and in all three fields of the entire value circle, we have different challenges and uh, without having the time to go into the details of that, I just want to uh, yeah, put your attention on the different things, what we could improve and where maybe some things are remaining to improve the entire process performance. Uh, here, just an overview about the projects we did and we still do. So, Kaffee Pla is coming to the end as the next one. Then we have two more European projects with yeah, some similar but also different topics to do. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And in case you have further questions, please feel free. Are there questions for Joachim to the 
Anyway, you can also later ask him uh, during the lunch break. Uh, he will be happy to, to answer every question which will be <laughs> maybe popping up later on. Very happy. So, thanks, Joachim. <laughs> thanks for, for presenting. Uh, so the next one will be Kevin. Kevin Sabe. Um, he's a biochemical engineer and He's a biochemical engineer and he's currently doing his PhD uh, study and he's originally also coming from anaerobic digestion sector. So beside this, uh, so he will present now on our chain elongation towards caproic acid. Yes, mm. thank you. Oops. Yeah, so uh, thank you for, your, for the introduction. So... Um, yeah, I'm working at, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Ghent University, more specifically at the Center for Microbial Ec Ecology and Technology. And as a project partner uh, within the Kaffeepla project, we are focusing on the production of medium chain carboxylic acids um, from lactic acid rich uh, waste streams. Now, first of all, what are these medium chain carboxylic acids? So they are organic acids with a carbon chain of six to 12 carbons. Um, and they can be used as, a, well, they have a number of applications, so as a feed additive, uh, but also as a, a, a bulk chemical for different processes. Um, and within Kaffeepla, uh, we want to produce an MCCA-rich bio-oil that is more specifically um, rich in caproic acid. Caproic acid is the, uh, the smallest MCCA, so with six uh, carbons, uh, caproic comes from the Latin word capra, which means goat, and that's because it also really smells like a, you're in a goat farm sometimes when you're in, in the lab where I'm working. Very, very pleasant. Um, so as I said, it can be used as a feed additive, and that's because it has uh, some antimicrobial capacity, so it could uh, potentially replace um, antibiotics in the animal feed. Um, and besides that, it can also serve as a feedstock chemical for different applications. So within the food sector, for example, it can be used for the production of uh, flavoring agents. Or it can also be used uh, for the production of bioplasticizers, dyes, and so on. And uh, also within the energy sector, it can be produced, or it can be used for the production of biofuels. Now, um, more recently, or like in the past years, we've it was discovered that caproic acid can also be produced um, biologically. Um, and within, uh, that's via a process called lactic acid chain elongation. Now, lactic acid is the substrate, and in the previous presentation, we've already seen that ATB uh, can produce the lactic acid from the organic waste. And then we receive um, this output, and we produce the caproic acid via the lactic acid chain elongation process. Now, besides that, we were also using an acetic acid uh, rich um, co substrate, which was produced by the loop, the, the very nice uh, pilot plant. And um, how does chain elongation now exactly work? So, of course, it starts with the lactic acid, um, and that is converted to first acetic acid, which is a two carbon um, short chain carboxylic acid. Then, this can combine with another acetic acid to form butyric and then again to caproic. So each time elongating the carbon chain with two carbons, hence the name chain elongation. So within Kaffeepla, um, our goal was threefold. So first we wanted to optimize the chain elongation process. Then um, when this was done, we also wanted to extract the caproic acid as an um, MCCA bio oil. And then finally, we also wanted to validate the process with the real broths being uh, produced within Kaffeepla. So we ran several reactors. Today I'm only going to cover uh, one type, which is the EGSB, uh, or the Expanded Granular Sludge Bed Reactor. Looks like this. Um, it's a, a special type of reactor where biomass retention is achieved by yeah, settling within the, the column. Um, there's a constant like, upflow of the reactor broth by recirculating the broth from the top to the bottom. Um, and the feed is being entered from the bottom, the effluent comes out from the top, there's also some pH control, and also the gas production is monitored. Um, and if you want to extract the caproic acid, we also had to um, insert a loop where there is some ultrafiltration, and then the biomass free permeate finally goes to 
our protraction system where the caproic acid is actively being extracted and concentrated in a bottle with an alkaline solution. But that's how our process works. Um, now for the optimization of the process, we first did that without um, the protraction. So this is a graph from during uh, the optimization period. Um, so what you see here is the product selectivity of what is being produced um, by our reactor. So the blue shades are the even chain carboxylic acid, so really the products of chain elongation. This is what we want. Um, the darkest blue in the graph is caproic acid. Then in green we have the uneven chain carboxylic acids and in pink also some isoforms. And we can divide this um, period into five uh, phases. So in the beginning we were only uh, feeding lactic acid with some glucose uh, because there is also some glucose present in the, in the real uh, broths. Then we switched um, to a broth or to a, a synthetic medium that also contains lactic, uh, sorry, acetic acid. Uh, in the next phase we doubled the glucose concentration and then uh, the two phases afterwards we did a restart of the reactor which I'm going to explain later. But first let's focus on these first um, three parts. So um, you can also see, I forgot to mention, there are some black lines and those indicate where, when I changed the hydraulic retention time of uh, the reactor. The reason why we wanted to decrease the uh, hydraulic retention time was to um, hopefully increase the caproic acid production rate. But as you can see, for the three different periods, whenever we decrease the, hydro, uh, the, the HRT, um, the butyric acid production rate increased, but the one of caproic acid kind of stayed stable uh, and wasn't very high. Um, this means that with, by playing with the HRT, we, we could kind of shift uh, the product spectrum between caproic and butyric, but we cannot really use the HRT to really increase um, the, the caproic acid production rate, at least not with the uh, synthetic medium. Um, and because after all the playing with the HRT and with the composition of the feed, um, at some point we kind of lost uh, the caproic acid production and we really couldn't get it back. Um, and you need this if you want to extract it, of course. So uh, we decided to restart the reactor with fresh inoculum. And uh, the first time we restarted it with a uh, medium containing also glucose and then because it didn't work. Um, we also restarted it with a medium not containing the glucose. So you can see if we compare the both uh, restarts, when you are using glucose, almost no caproic acid production, whereas as soon as we left out the glucose, the caproic acid was being produced again, which was worrying us because this was now with synthetic feed, we could kind of choose what was in there, but yeah, the coffee pla broths that we were going to use, they also contain a lot of sugars, so this could potentially inhibit the caproic acid production. But okay, since we had caproic acid production again, we moved to the extraction. Um, so here you see a similar graph, except that here this is the um, extraction selectivity. So as soon as we switched to um, the protraction, you could see that the butyric uh, acid uh, concentration or selectivity was going up again. Um, and then we switched to the real broth, thinking like, okay, bye-bye uh, caproic acid, but no, we got the highest caproic acid selectivity that we achieved so far, so that was really great. Um, so we were at, at some point, so the, the butyric acid um, selectivity completely went to, to zero, and we had a caproic acid selectivity of 93%. Uh, um, then I want to finish with some pictures. So the first picture is the actual EGSB in the lab. Um, his name is Eduardo. I name my, my I give a, a name to every reactor I have because they have their own personality, uh, so they deserve a name. Uh, and here it was already being fed with a, a real broth. And then um, the bottle you see is actually this alkaline solution where the caproic acid is being concentrated. In the beginning, this is just transparent and, and colorless, and then the longer you run the protraction, uh, the darker yellowish brown it becomes. And then from that bottle, uh, after we run the protraction long enough, we, we swap it and we get the bio oil out. So from two protraction runs that uh, we did, we produced these um, 
bio oils. So um, until now, there was a like, almost like an even balance between butyric and, and caproic acid, but at high concentration, so for caproic acid, this was 210 grams per liter and uh, 220 grams per liter. Um, but now that the selectivity for caproic acid is so high, um, next week I will make a next batch of bio oil and we expect that there it will be mainly caproic acid that's um, in there. So that brings me to the conclusions. So we optimized the, the chain elongation process. We could see that um, it was way more efficient and stable when we also were using um, acetic acid uh, as a substrate together with the lactic acid. The higher HRT has kind of a negative effect, uh, the shorter HRT has a, a rather negative effect on the selectivity for caproic acid. Uh, and with synthetic medium, also the glucose concentration. Um, we were able to, in the end, produce some MCCA bio oil that contains a, a lot of caproic acid, and we validated the uh, process with the Kaffeepla broths. So uh, I would also like to thank my promoters, uh, Ramon and Nico, uh, because they gave me a lot of advice, but also my student, because he works very hard. Uh, together we suffered a lot in the 37 degree room, um, so he also deserves some credit. So I'm open to any questions that you may have. Are there any questions for Kevin? They are very shy. They will, they will come out so to you in the, in the lunch break afterwards. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Okay. The, the, yeah. um, okay, um, <laughs> the next one, um, also after we have heard now lactic acid, it's a chemical, uh, caproic acid or medium chain carboxylic acids also chemical. Uh, Anna, Anna Carolas from Biotrend uh, will speak about um, yeah, the production of PHAs, PHPV from different types of side streams. Maybe to mention Anna is really an expert in fermentation uh, process development. I work already se several years uh, together and uh, the results are normally quite, quite good. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas, for the nice presentation. Um, good morning. Um, today I will be, will be speaking about side stream derived biopolymers. And as Thomas said, I work at Biotrend. Um, let me see. Okay. Uh, um, and Biotrend is a biotech company based in Portugal. Uh, and uh, we work on the development and optimization of bioprocesses with the aim of improve, improving productivities and yields and titers of uh, several uh, molecules or biomasses. And we are um, very comfortable in working with several biological systems that go from bacteria to yeast to uh, filamentous fungi. Not only we work on the development uh, of uh, cultivation strategies, but also on upstream uh, and uh, downstream processes uh, of the uh, uh, production stages. And we also work on scale-up and de-risking um, in fully controlled bioreactors that go from a 2 liter to 250 liter scale uh, at Biotrend facilities. Uh, uh, however, if needed, we also work with uh, partners that have bigger capacities that go up to 200,000 liters. So, what's the interest in uh, using side streams to produce uh, um, molecules uh, like, the, like biopolymers? Uh, as our uh, already some of the uh, speakers uh, talked to you about, there is, of course, an interest in uh, shifting from a linear uh, bioeconomy to uh, a circular bioeconomy. And, um, and, and so the main goal here, I would say, that is reducing the waste in landfill uh, by using these uh, side streams and, and not only uh, 
not only to uh, also reduce the, the use of, of uh, refined raw materials to produce those, those products, but also to uh, transition from, from uh, a petrochemical way of producing those, those camels to a more uh, sustainable way of doing that. And by doing that, we are, we're going to be able to reduce the production costs and also to produce uh, more uh, environmentally friendly chemicals. So, talking specifically about uh, plastics, as you already know, most of them are still produced not only using uh, petrochemical uh, resources, but also uh, using refined uh, um, raw materials like glucose or oils that compete with the food and feed crops. And this is something that we need to, to change. And so there is a lot of, there has been a lot of research uh, uh, in order to uh, develop processes uh, in which side streams of several processes uh, can be used as an alternative. And these are some of, of the industries that generate waste that can be then converted into um, biopolymers. And uh, Biotrend uh, has been working for over 10 years in several projects with the goal of um, optimizing those processes. And these are some of, of the, the projects that we work on. And um, mainly, uh, this process entails the conversion of the waste into uh, solutions of uh, sugars or oils or carboxylic acids that can then be used as carbon source in bacterial fermentations for the production of the bioplastics after extraction and purification. So we have been talking about bioplastics, biopolymers, uh, and there are uh, several kinds of bioplastics. Uh, some of them are produced using uh, natural uh, molecules like uh, polysaccharides, as, uh, like starch or cellulose, or even uh, using uh, proteins like alginate or um, uh, wheat uh, gluten, for example. But there is another way of producing bioplastics and is biobacterial fermentation using renewable feedstocks. And these uh, bioplastics are called polyhydroxyalkane weights, which are a class of bio-based uh, polyesters, which have uh, attractive properties for thermal processing applications. Uh, and these bioplastics are produced within cells as um, in granules, in granules um, as a source of energy uh, material. And so depending on the raw material that we are using to produce those bioplastics, then we will have polymers, we, we end up having polymers with different uh, compositions. And we, for example, we have a polymer uh, made of only one kind of monomeric unit, it's called a homopolymer, and we've if, on the other hand, it is composed of two different monomeric units, it's called a copolymer and so on. And so by, um, by um, playing with these different compositions of the raw materials, we'll have different polymers in the end with different mechanical properties. And that, that is something that is... Uh, some, is something that is very uh, useful if we envisage uh, a wide range of applications for it. So what's the motivation for keeping investing in developing and optimizing protocols for bacterial fermentation? Uh, today, uh, still today, m most of the uh, PHA produced is uh, by using pure cultures, uh, using refined um, refined um, materials as um, as uh, as carbon source, and these, of course, these sugars and oils compete with food crops, and that is something that needs to be avoided, as you, uh, I'm sure, understand why. In addition, uh, the products in the market have very limited uh, material grades, which in turn limit the range of the final applications of the of the, the product the product and by using refined raw materials uh, to produce the PHA of course 
the cost of production is high and not competitive with the uh, petrochemical uh, the, uh, plastics uh, that are still uh, the major part in the market. And so if we want, in fact, to transition from the production of uh, traditional plastics, let's say, we need to uh, improve these processes in order to uh, reduce the production costs. And of course, if we want to uh, transition to uh, a market where most of the plastics are bio-based, then we need to increase the, pro the uh, production capacity. And today still are very few PHA produ uh, manufacturers in the market. Um, sorry, this one. Um, of course, that uh, by using side streams to produce PHA, there are some challenges that still need to be addressed. And one of them is related to the heterogeneous um, um, nature of those side streams that uh, lead to varying compositions uh, of the polymer and varying yields and polymer contents, and that is something that needs still, still needs to be improved. Also, regarding the purification step, uh, there's uh, still some challenging challenges uh, due to this uh, heterogeneous uh, nature of the side streams. Of course, also, if we envisage, envisage uh, a process that is uh, uh, coupled with the side stream manufacturers, um, we have to think of ways of um, simplify, let's say, the purification process. And still today, most of the, the purification processes are using solvents that are not very environmentally friendly, nor safe. And so, uh, it, it, it would be, uh, it, it is something that is still needs to be worked uh, on and, and uh, a lot of research still needs to, to be done in order to uh, make it easier to uh, purify it using an aqueous, aqueous uh, method, which means that in, uh, the side streams producers do not have uh, do not need to have um, a dedicated set of equipments to perform the, the extractions, nor the operators need a specific training to perform this purification step. And this is, again, something that is still a challenge uh, nowadays. Uh, so I've been talking about challenges, but the research uh, for the production of PHJ through bacterial fermentation uh, has uh, already a long history, and uh, we already know a lot of, uh, we have a, a very wide uh, base of knowledge uh, to work on. And uh, regarding the production of PHA, we can do it using mixed cultures and pure cultures. And the main advantage of using mi mixed culture cultures, I would say, is the lower production costs. However, typically uh, using these systems that are not fully characterized, there will be more uh, limitations in terms of regulatory approval for uh, a wider range of applications, specifically for food contact applications. And that is something that uh, it, it doesn't happen or is less significant when using pure cultures. And at Biotrend, we only, we only develop processes using pure cultures, which give us an enhanced uh, robustness of the process across scales uh, because the system is fully characterized. And this, in turn, uh, may lead to uh, a, a more easily approval of, of the end products for a wider range of applications, as I said. So in a very general way, how do we produce the PHJ within the cells? So uh, normally the process is uh, uh, divided into in two stages. The first one where there is biomass buildup, where the cells grow because we are giving them all they need to, uh, to, in, uh, to, um, to increase. And then by tri triggering a nutrient limitation like a phosphate or a nitrogen limitation, then the cells respond to that stress by accumulating PHA within the cells. 
So in order to um, develop and optimize the fermentation process for PEJ production, there are uh, several parameters that need to be considered and need to be optimized uh, in order to achieve that goal. And some of them are, you, you can see here, the main thing is you, you need to give all the cells a need to, to grow. Um, so like the best conditions of pH, temperature, um, um, we also need to optimize the, the batch medium and the, 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 the feed compositions as typically we use fed batch fermentations to produce PHA. And for some raw materials, one, another parameter that, that is essential to be fine-tuned is the, the, the feed profiling. And th this is the case for the use of carboxylic acids as carbon source because they are toxic to the cells. Uh, and so we need to really find a balance between supplying enough carbon to the cells for them to grow, but also uh, um, um, uh, store, uh, but, uh, but in, uh, in turn, we need to avoid that uh, carboxylic acids accumulate within the broth so that they don't become growth inhibiting. And of course, after uh, optimizing this, uh, this process at lab scale, we uh, scale up the process and again, another set of parameters need to be addressed in order to uh, su successfully scale up the process. And some of the parameters are the seed train, the feed regimen control that sometimes needs to be adjusted. And also we, we need to take into account that there is going to be oxygen, different oxygen transfer efficiencies when we go upscale and also variable concentration of nutrients. And this of course will affect the behavior of the culture. After the production stage, another uh, crucial step to uh, uh, obtaining a pure PHA is the, the, the extraction and purification step. As I said before, today, to, to this day, most of the processes are still using solvents, which are not uh, environmentally friendly and sometimes not safe for the operators. So we need to... Uh, um, find solutions for it. And uh, throughout the years, Biotrend has been developing, uh, which is now a proprietary solvent free protocol for PHA recovery. That, of course, needs to be fine tuned uh, depending on the biomass that is generated. And sometimes th the uh, aggressiveness of the protocol, of the conditions, uh, need to be increased in order to uh, obtain a, a better quality polymer. Uh, however, this may come to a cost uh, and uh, sometimes uh, increasing the aggressiveness of the, the, the conditions will lead to some, to some PHB degradation. So we need to find a balance between uh, all these, all these uh, uh, parameters. And this is an example of how increasing the uh, aggressiveness of the conditions for the extraction of PHA has resulted in a polymer that after eating uh, is similar to the benchmark. So from left to the right, we are increasing the, um, the aggressiveness of the conditions in the extraction protocol. And after eating the, the polymer, it melts and it's uh, and the goal is to be as transparent as possible, and that's what we get when compared to the benchmark. And of course, after uh, the, 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 the extraction uh, of the polymer, it needs to be characterized in terms of monomeric composition, thermal behavior, crystallinity, molecular weight, and so on. It's that in the Cafiplo project, it was done uh, by Technalia. Um, and it, that, this is something that is also crucial so that we know uh, what are the properties of the polymer that we get and this in turn will d define in some way what, ki what kind of applications we can envis envisage for this polymer. Um, and in these pictures you can see uh, examples of prototypes that were 
produced uh, with polymer obtained with an aqueous solvent, uh, aqueous, aqueous protocol for extraction. Um, and these were produced by melt extrusion, casting, 3D printing, and uh, we saw that there was, um, in general, pres a preservation of the properties of the, the polymer. Okay, so now I just I want to briefly go through some examples of polymers uh, that we obtained uh, in several projects and using different side streams as a carbon source for the production of uh, PHA. Uh, and uh, here I just want you to focus on the table in the middle of the slide. Uh, in this case, it was one of the first projects we worked on uh, in which acid digestion was applied to extract the polymer from the cells. And to you, what you can see uh, here is that the molecular weight uh, obtained was in line with the commercial PHB. In another project where uh, spent sulfate liquor uh, from, uh, which is a side stream from the paper and uh, pulp industry, was used as carbon source, which resulted in a biomass uh, quite, uh, quite uh, dark. And in this case, we decided to, uh, to use a, a, an extraction protocol uh, with alkaline and bleach. Um, and of course, in this case, we also got a polymer that was similar to, uh, in terms of molecular weight, with the commercial PHB, but this extraction protocol is not ideal because it's using bleach, which is a chlorinated uh, chemical and so not very environmentally friendly. So uh, that those are two examples of protocols that are ev that are. Although results in good properties uh, for the, uh, the polymer generated, they are not the best ones if we want to uh, have a more environmentally friendly uh, process and, and simple process. And that's what we've been developing and what we used in the case of the, the polymers produced in the Cafipla project. So in this case, in this third example that I will give you, and I will talk in a little bit in more detail, uh, the, the PHA produced was then ex purified using an aqueous uh, method protocol. So I will... Uh, uh, I will not talk in much detail uh, about this because it was already uh, uh, talked by the other uh, um, colleagues. But um, in a very simple way, we are using in the Cafipla project carboxylic acids, short-chain carboxylic acids, that were produced by anaerobic digestion of the uh, organic uh, uh, fraction of municipal solid waste by anaerobic di digestion, which is something that was uh, developed uh, by OWS. And then the, um, the, this fraction was then uh, purified and concentrated by Technalia and used by Biotrend as carbon source for bacterial fermentation. And as I said before, depending on the composition of the raw, uh, raw materials used as carbon source, and in this case are carboxylic acids, we will end up in, in, in the end of the production process with polymers with different um, compositions and of course different mechanical properties. So during the Cafipla project we, dev we uh, developed uh, a fermentation protocol for uh, the bacterial fermentation uh, of carboxylic acids into PHA, and this was done initially using synthetic carboxylic acids as a model. And what you can see here in these uh, results is that throughout this, the, the several uh, generation of, of, trials, of trials, we were able to increase not only the uh, biomass production, uh, you can see in, in uh, black, but also the uh, PHA production and PHJ content in cells does not vary uh, too much because it's more like uh, a characteristic of the strain used. After optimizing this protocol at lab scale using the synthetic CSAs, uh, we uh, validated the protocol using a, 
a sample or a carboxylic acid from the project. And as you can see here, the results were better than the first in, than the initial trials carried out with synthetic CSA. So although they're not yet at the same level as uh, the, uh, uh, the trials carried out afterwards, there is potential for continuous improve, improval of this. And here, I just want to stress out again that depending on the composition of the raw materials, uh, that can vary in composition of in the, the several carboxylic acids, then we will have uh, the production of a PHA with different uh, monomeric compositions, uh, and of course, in turn, with different mechanical properties. So I don't want to go into much detail, but you can see that there's a difference in the composition depending on the composition of the raw material used. Of course, again, after the production, we need to purify the, um, uh, the, the PHA produced. And here, I want, to, uh, to, and want you to focus first on these two pictures that is, are an example of, um, of what we need to take into account when developing a protocol. And uh, such as a simple thing like the way we were drying the polymer affected, it, affected significantly um, the polymer uh, produced. And by spray drying, we ended up getting a very thin white powder, which is much easier for further processing than this version uh, uh, dried in the oven. And now, um, just a quiz for you. Can you please tell me, anyone can guess, what is this arrow, arrow pointing to? No one wants to <laughs> take a chance? OK. Mm. There's no price in the end, but you can still guess. Plastic. Sorry? Plastic. Very well, Marieline. <laughs> So the reason you are uh, not being able to uh, see it properly is because uh, Technalia was able to produce by casting a very thin PHA film that it, when put over uh, a text, it's not possible to, to see it clearly. So um, there is a high transparency of this film, and if it's thin enough, it can be used in food package, packaging applications, which is a very nice result for the Cafiplo project. Uh, and to finish, I just uh, want you to, to, to leave you with a message, is that, of course, it's not possible to uh, think of a world without plastics, but we can indeed uh, transition to uh, um, a, a system where the uh, petrochemical plastics are, um, are um, let's say, substituted by bio-based plastics that are, have the potential of being more uh, sustainable and with better uh, environmentally friendly properties. So, um, that, that is the reason why we need to keep investing in projects like Cafipla, so that sometime in the f near future, we can in fact live in a world with uh, better options in terms of environment. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? I think everybody... <laughs> Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, just could you please go back to the okay. summary? Uh, can you please can you, put can again you put the, uh, the presentation? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about that uh, two paragraphs, what you mentioned in the end. That in, the, uh, uh, in the last slide? Yeah, the last slide. Okay that the carbon sources uh, used for biomass and PHA could be obtained from waste streams. And then the, the, the Cafipla approach with the SCCA 
Do you yeah. have a direct comparison if you would go directly from the waste somehow mm -hmm. compared to that what we do with the steps in between to produce the SCCAs, to purify, to concentrate, and so on and so far, which is costly and time-consuming, I, I guess. So do you have a comparison if you would use the organic waste directly for your fermentation? Would it be possible? Mm, I don't believe it's possible, no. It's too much a complex uh, stream to be used by pure cultures for, for them to be able to, uh, in a productive way, to transfer them directly into PHA. Okay, I see. I would say so. I think it's, there's, <laughs> that's all the time then the question that maybe it's possible, but it's not from, a, from an economic point of view. Yes. The, the, the yeah, but we don't have the figures. No. No, no. no. Uh, Bruno has a question. <laughs> no. yeah, uh, uh. Uh, so we've been involved in different projects in which. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Bruno, wait, 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 wait one second for the for the micro. Yes, I, I think I, I, I know what Bruno is going to say. But, uh, <laughs> he's better at say it. Please sit down. <laughs> No, what I was going to say is that we've been involved in different projects that do exactly what you mentioned, So they, but they use mixed cultures in order to be able, as Anna uh, said, to cope with the diversity of the raw material that goes in and the fluctuation of these raw materials throughout the, the seasons or whatever. And what we've noticed is that um, it may sound cheaper because here we're doing, we, we do have a mixed culture, it's in, in, the, in, in the anaerobic digester, but we're kind of getting the filet mignon from the process, <laughs> which are the, 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 the carboxylic acids. And these are the perfect raw materials to go into the pure culture fermentation. If we have a mixed culture doing both, from our experience, not only the productivity is not as high, it's very far from it, but then in the downstream processing, all the gains that you may have in the production and the, and the cost of the production of the, the, the PHAs, you lose it totally in the downstream processing, not only in terms of costs, but also in the mechanical properties of the polymer at the end because you need to be much more aggressive, as Anna mentioned in the presentation, that affects the product in the end. At least that's uh, what we experienced. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. So, if there are no more questions, uh, then I know everyone is waiting for the, the, the lunch break. Uh, so then I would say then we make a uh, lunch break and we meet here again at, what is set at 2.40. So that will be more or less in one hour. Yep. The lunch break will be again uh, where the coffee break was before in the mirador. Okay, thank you very much.